Hi, I'm Mike Ross. I'm running for governor of Louis Arkansas. <laughs> uh, I actually could not resist today uh, going into the Mike Ross for governor headquarters to get some Mike Ross gear. And he, <laughs> and he was there, and I got a picture and a T-shirt with Mike Ross, which will go onto the Facebook page that I'm a member of for guys named Mike Ross. And there's about 150 of us. So you can look for that. OK, uh, so uh, the book that I'm talking about tonight, The Great New Orleans Kidnapping Case, uh, I, I just want to uh, explain to you how I found it, because I was uh, kind of a meat and potatoes uh, legal constitutional scholar. I wrote a biography of a Supreme Court justice as my uh, dissertation and, and first book. Uh, but I was in the midst of reading every single page of the newspapers in New Orleans in June of 1870, looking for references to the slaughterhouse cases, which were the first case, they eventually became the first case where the Supreme Court interprets the 14th Amendment. But as I was doing it, there on the side of the page was a report that a white baby had been abducted from the back of town by two African-American women and that the uh, belief was that the baby was going to be used as a voodoo sacrifice. After the Civil War, the practitioners of uh, voodoo in New Orleans are able to practice out in the open where they had to practice in secrecy during the days of slavery. And now, because this abduction happens two weeks before St. John's Eve in June, a uh, evening uh, uh, sacred in the uh, uh, voodoo uh, religion, they spread this rumor. And every historian has, digging around in historical materials has had this moment where something distracts you. You're like, oh my god, that's good. And you usually go back to what you're doing. But as I read on, because I was reading every day, the story got bigger and bigger. Suddenly the police are rounding up practitioners of voodoo, and all kinds of complications are ensuing, and I just got totally sucked in. And the result is the uh, book that I'm speaking about this evening. So this is New Orleans in 1870. There's more kind of detailed maps in the book. But when we're talking about the area called the back of town, if there's an area back between the town and New Orleans, uh, between the Mississippi River and uh, closer to Lake Pontchartrain, it's low and swampy, and it's an area that was affordable to live in because it flooded all the time. And in that neighborhood, Irish immigrants, famine Irish, uh, German immigrants who come to New Orleans after the failure of the revolutions of 1848, former slaves who have come in from the plantations after freedom, and Afro-Creoles, the uh, French-speaking indigenous population of New Orleans are all living on top of one another. And this is where this uh, abduction occurs. It's the street that the Digbys lived on, Thomas and Bridget Digby and their daughter Molly who's abducted, uh, is this street right here, which is today uh, where you walk down as you head into the Superdome for Saints games. So as all my friends were thinking about whether the Saints were going to win, I was in my mind imagining this moment at the Digby's former lodging. And this is the kind of article that caught my eye. This one is actually uh, a little further into the story. This is from the Mobile Register. Mobile also has an Afro-Creole community and, and voodoo practitioners. But a horrible suspicion is connected in the public mind with the abduction of the infant child of Mr. Digby of New Orleans, which took place the 9th of June in that city. And one of the things that I found so interesting uh, even though I was certain that this was a figment of fevered white imaginations, is that it very get quickly becomes entangled with the fearsome politics of Reconstruction. 1870 is the height of Reconstruction in New Orleans. As you saw in the video, you have a 28-year-old Union veteran carpetbagger, that, as those critics called him, governor, uh, uh, Henry Clay Warmoth is, is running the state. African Americans have been elected to the Louisiana legislature. About a third of them are African American. African American men are voting. They're serving in government jobs. They're serving on juries. And the uh, white press that is opposed to Republican or radical Reconstruction uh, is determined to use this sensationalized case as an example of the world has been turned upside down, and this is what's going to happen over and over again now that the state has been, as they put it in their terms, Africanized. This is a depiction 
uh, of a voodoo ceremony. This one is not particularly pejorative. This is more often how voodoo was portrayed in the uh, white press, superstition, depravity, and lust locked arms when the practitioners of voodoo uh, actually believed themselves to be practicing Catholics during the Spanish colonial period. They were welcomed into uh, the, the, the major uh, Catholic churches of New Orleans to set up voodoo, voodoo altars, which were always two Catholic saints. There's a depiction of the Louisiana legislature in 1870 of the African-American members. About a third of the legislature is African-American. And African-American men, of course, voting, starting even before the 15th Amendment, thanks to the Military Reconstruction Act in 1867 in the South. Now, one of the interesting parts of this story is that the Reconstruction governor had just recently, before this abduction, also integrated the New Orleans police force. And the, the policemen uh, are, uh, who are African-American are uh, a courageous people because there's lots of people who are willing to use violence to overturn Reconstruction, and black policemen with authority to arrest whites was for some people too much to bear, and they are constant targets of ambushes and attacks, uh, et cetera. Uh, New Orleans, this are five southern cities will have African-American policemen during Reconstruction. This is way ahead of the North. The North, you won't, New York City won't get its first black policeman until 1911. New Orleans is one of the few southern cities that had a detective force. Detectives had become the most glamorous figures in law enforcement by mid-century, thanks to the short stories of Edgar Allan Poe and, and uh, little magazines like the Police Gazette that people read, and this idea of these skilled sleuths using deductive reasoning to solve crimes had made them very glamorous. New Orleans had had detectives before the Civil War, but they're gonna get their first black detectives, and I, I still have not been able to confirm this, but I think they're the first black detectives in American history. I don't think other southern cities had it. And, uh, one in particular is going to play a crucial role in this case. That's a critical depiction of the Reconstruction Legislature. This is what critics, and some of you have seen depictions like this in movies like Birth of a Nation or suggestions of it in Gone with the Wind, uh, that it is just a, a uh, debauchery of former slaves who it's been illegal to teach to write and uh, poor scalawag whites who betray their race and that things were just running amok in Louisiana. That's how the critics wanted to depict it. And often when you uh, read accounts in the white papers of the day, they want to portray all the uh, so-called carpetbaggers as corrupt, all of the black legislatures as illiterate and debauched, and all of the poor whites who side with Reconstruction as essentially what planters called them before the Civil War, poor white trash. Now, as the Digby case uh, uh, unfolds, one of the interesting things I found is that the elite white women of New Orleans, both the white Creole women and the white women who were married to the Americans who came after uh, the Louisiana Purchase and built the Garden District, are going to, as a group, embrace this case and embrace the Digby family when normally they would keep their distance from working class Irish in rough sections of town. And I wanna read you a passage from the book about this and I'll give you some idea of how the, uh, the book is written because I attempted to write this book in a way that uh, was not written for historians but is written uh, so that it's actually enjoyable to read. Uh, my wife uh, still is not done. She's got to the first, end of the first chapter of my first book, but she's finished this one. So let me, uh, let me read to you a passage here about the, the white uh, women of New Orleans getting involved in the Digby case. As gov coverage of the Digby abduction became more sensational, prominent white women from the most famous New Orleans families adopted the Digby case as their own. In late June and early July, wealthy women of New Orleans would usually be preparing to leave town for cooler climes. Just as many theaters and restaurants closed for the season each summer, elite families put linen covers on furniture, packed white dresses, suits, and Panama hats into trunks, and set off by rail and steamboat for the coast, the north, or Europe. 
But in 1870, Mathilde Ogden, Armentina Jan, Louisa Huger, and wives of dozens of the city's other richest financiers, merchants, and cotton factors took time to march to police headquarters to demand resolution of the Digby case. They also went en masse into the back of town, a neighborhood they ordinarily avoided, bringing food and other gifts to the Digby's modest house. By intertwining themes of motherhood, crime, and race, the Digby case provided an opportunity for the city's elite women to enter the public debate over Reconstruction and to express publicly their anger at Governor Warmoth, his biracial police force, and the emerging racial order in Louisiana. Raised in a culture that required them to behave as traditional ladies, most elite women left public commentary on politics, business, and civic affairs to men. But in early July, 61 prominent women presented a petition to Warmoth urging him to do something so that, quote, the painful feeling of the community in regard to this lawless outrage may be allayed by the early restoration of the, the child to those who love it. This is Governor Henry Clay Warmoth. 28 years old, his critics called him the boy governor. Warmoth is, I'm going to argue, I, when I was in uh, Mike Ross's campaign office today, one of his uh, uh, staffers told me that the houses up there near his campaign office is known as Carpetbagger Row. Is that something that, that there are a bunch of houses built by Northerners who came here after the Civil War? And the story has always been that these were people who didn't have any money in the North. A carpet bag was a bag made out of uh, cheap carpet remnants. And in the first era of railroad travel, people didn't have a lot of money, but were traveling on railroads by suitcases made out of carpet remnants. And that they came down to the South after the war when the South is completely crushed in order to exploit them and get rich, get elected off of the votes of uh, uh, former slaves who didn't know what they were doing and, and then be corrupt officials. And uh, historians since about 1951 have been telling a uh, different story that is much more complex. You, you can find some examples of corrupt uh, uh, government officials, just as you will be able to before and after Reconstruction, but many of these guys really believe that they're doing uh, God's work. And they believed, and you can see why this might have rubbed some people the wrong way, they believed that what the South needed was Northern guidance, and that a backward South that had been saddled with slavery and, and a, a mostly agricultural economy needed Northerners to come down, show them how to build public schools, how to build factories, roads, railroads, sanitation systems, and that with Northern gu guidance, a gospel of prosperity, they could turn uh, the South into the paradise that they believed the North was. And uh, they didn't realize just how ferocious the resistance would be to the, them trying to turn the order in the South upside down. But they really believed they were doing something uh, uh, honorable. They called it the gospel of prosperity. And they hoped that as public schools went up and factories came and the railroads got built or rebuilt, that businessmen in particular who uh, wanted to uh, uh, put economic development ahead of racial animosity would get lured to the Republican Party and say, you know what, these folks are doing something here. And this has been you know, something that the United States has done for a long time, is gone to places where there's uh, populations that are resistant and tried to create a society in their own image. And that's what the carpetbaggers, as they were called by their critics, were doing. And Warmoth desperately wants to do this. The New Orleans police force had been a police force that was essentially the political army of whoever was governor, uh, full of uh, uh, political thugs. And at election time, whoever was governor or mayor of New Orleans could use the New Orleans police to beat people up as they went to the polls. In the 1850s, the city, this is kind of odd, New Orleans is a Catholic-dominated city, but in the 1850s, the mayor of New Orleans is part of the Know Nothing Party. The Know Nothing Party was a national movement against the Irish. Uh, and, uh, and because there are a lot of Irish immigrants in New Orleans, you have a Know Nothing mayor of New Orleans, and the police force are all these anti-Irish thugs who are just beating people bloody when it comes time to elections. And that had been the case. And Warmoth says, we're not going to do that. I'm going to make this police force 
uh, a, a model to show you what good policing is going to be. He brings in instructors from Boston and Philadelphia, uh, has all kinds of physical and literacy tests all the policemen have to take, puts in all these regulations for how they have to behave, trains them in the latest policing techniques, you know, expands the system of call boxes through the city where you turned a key to send an electrical signal to this precinct house so you could send out the police in a hurry. And he wants to show that his police force, which is also integrated, can solve this crime. And he becomes personally involved, puts up a $5,000 state reward for the return of Molly Digby or the capture of her kidnappers, which is about forty dollars or $50,000 today, which in a post-war Louisiana is a lot of money. The case becomes the Powerball of the summer of 1870, where everyone who sees an African-American woman with a white baby thinks they've seen the Digby baby. Of course, in a society where African-Americans were the nursemaids to countless white babies, these reports are coming in from everywhere. But he also has his police chief, Algernon Sidney Badger, a Massachusetts-born Union Army veteran, handpick certain detectives to handle the case. And he picks uh, ones that he thinks will represent the integrated force well. And this is going to include, sadly, there's one that gets picked, and he only makes a short appearance in the story, and I wish it was more because it's such a great story. They pick, one of the people picked for the case is 72-year-old Jordan Noble, who was Andrew Jackson's drummer boy in the Battle of New Orleans in 1812, and then goes on to be the drummer boy for the elite uh, Washington artillery of New Orleans, which fights in the Seminole Wars and the Mexican Wars. During the Civil War, he joins the Union Army uh, and then into the police force. He'll make a, a small appearance in the book that you read where he joins my lead detective, Detective Jordan, where they go dressed as common laborers into an African-American section of town to fool people that they're just kind of regular guys and uh, get, try to get information. Uh, but the other one that he picks is my man, Jean-Baptiste Jordan. And he, uh, I don't have a picture of Jordan. What I have a picture of on the screen are uh, various famous Afro-Creoles from New Orleans. Now, you folks are close enough to New Orleans that I'm sure all of you have been a number of times and have some idea of who the Afro-Creoles were. But it is a very interesting group, still around today. I was just at a book event on Friday hosted by the Baquet family, who are descendant from my detective. The Baquets own a famous Creole restaurant there called Lunch Place, called Little Dizzy's. Uh, the brothers, Baquet, are uh, photographers. Dean Baquet is now the executive ed editor of the New York Times. And uh, they are all descended from Jordan and very proud of their Afro-Creole background. Why they are so interesting for the for purposes of our story is that because they were free before the Civil War, because they emerge from the French and Spanish colonial culture, uh, they are very polished, well-educated men and women who can serve in these public roles and put the lie to critics in the white press who say that African Americans, particularly those who were recently enslaved, are not qualified to hold these positions. And I thought uh, I'd read to you quickly a passage about the Afro-Creoles. I only do this, I would, I would never do this in New Orleans. People would look at me like, why are you, who, who are you know, from the north somewhere, telling us about the Afro-Creoles? But I'll do it to you folks. Just, just so you could get some, some sense here. As a Creole of color, or Afro-Creole, Detective Jordan belonged to a class of mixed race men and women unique to the Gulf Coast. Although the term Creole had different meanings in different societies, in colonial Louisiana, anyone born in the colony was called a Creole. Over time, Louisianians, black and white, who identified with French culture and language and feared being overwhelmed by the American parvenus who arrived in New Orleans after the Louisiana Purchase, self-identified as Creoles. Afro-Creoles of Jordan's class considered themselves to be cosmopolitan gentlemen and ladies. Bilingual and manner mannerly, they looked to Paris for aesthetic inspiration. Many elite Afro-Creole men wore stylish silk pants, leather slippers, and fine jackets. 
They dined with silver utensils, filled their homes with books and mahogany furniture, attended the opera, published their own newspaper, studied classical literature, formed exclusive Masonic lodges, and drew inspiration from the egalitarian ideals of the French Revolution. Their ranks included writers, poets, painters, sculptors, and composers, as well as doctors, merchants, and skilled artisans. Even under the slave regime, Creoles of color took great, great pride in the Francophone identity they shared with white Creoles. Both white and black Creoles practiced Gallic Catholicism, read French language periodicals, and relished wine food, uh, wine food served with rich sauces and French colonial architecture. White Creoles patronized black Creole butchers, grocers, tailors, carpenters, and mechanics. They attended plays and cockfights and circuses together, albeit on a segregated basis. In New Orleans on Grand Opera Nights, Tuesdays and Thursdays, a portion of the gallery was occupied by the gens de color libre. But the relationship between white and black Creoles was, you, or this, there were limits to, to this affinity amongst Creoles, of course. White Creoles expected Creoles of color to know their place in the racial hierarchy. Breaches of etiquette, improper remarks, or untoward gestures could cause confrontations but the relationship between white and black Creoles was usually one of goodwill and mutual respect. And oh, some people have argued that New Orleans and Mobile, which also had an Afro-Creole class, are the places where Reconstruction stood its best chance for success because you had an indigenous population that was qualified to serve in, in public office. In other parts of the South, there's lots of qualified African-American office holders, but lots of them come from the North. But in Mobile and in New Orleans, you had this uh, population that's extraordinarily polished, and some whites in the city, the Francophone population, uh, genuinely liked. And uh, Jean-Baptiste Jordan is of that group and will lead uh, the investigate a good portion of the investigation to find Molly Digby. So you're starting to see what I saw here. You know, this is just this little reference and this is a case that uh, even though it will captivate the nation, this will be on the front page of papers across the country, has kind of been lost from the American memory and suddenly I've got the first African American detective in, um, in American history and, and all of this rich New Orleans story, and no one had ever written a, a word about it. So, there's Creole strolling after a matinee in New Orleans. There's the police chief, Algernon Sidney Badger. Uh, those of you who are fans of the uh, Civil War uh, will know Badger's Massachusetts unit. They were the first uh, regiment to arrive at the beginning of the war in response to Lincoln's call for volunteers, and while they're changing trains in Baltimore, get ambushed by a pro-Confederate mob that attacks them, and they have to shoot their way across the city. Uh, and for a time, Lincoln is totally cut off in Washington because these troops aren't arriving. They eventually have to send troops in by boat. But Badger, from the first moments of the war, has seen the face of uh, white resistance. And again, everywhere you went in New Orleans and the South, you would find uh, African-American women with white children. And now the police are regularly stopping them all and trying to search for identifying marks on the child to see if it's Molly Digby. At one point in the case, um, uh, they bring in a clairvoyant. Uh, she's in town uh, as part of a traveling act, but many people in New Orleans and the time in the United States believed in spiritualism and table wrapping. You know Mary Lincoln did. She had seances at the White House where they were searching for their dead son that they made President Lincoln attend. So they bring in a clairvoyant uh, who comes out of the seance saying, I know exactly where the baby is, and you can read the book to find out what happens. And. Uh, these are houses in uptown New Orleans. Uh, I don't want to, I'm not going to tell you what happened to Molly Digby uh, tonight. You, you can read the book. Uh, I can tell you, sorry, this was free, wasn't it? I don't have to. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, but I can tell you uh, the, who are the women that uh, uh, will be accused and put on trial for the case. 
And uh, sadly, a lot of the structures that were central to the story are uh, gone. But these are houses across the street from the houses uh, where uh, the women who are accused uh, uh, lived and worked and uh, built in the exact same style. So this is what their house uh, would, have, would have looked like. And the women that are accused are a pair of Afro-Creole sisters that the press is going to, both the, the, the Francophone press, which has a soft spot for the Afro-Creoles, and the white press are going to go on and on about how beautiful and stylish and calm and composed these women are. And it's a pair of sisters, Ellen Fallon and her sister, Louisa Fallon Murray, who she, the one sister lives in Mobile and the other is in New Orleans. And they run a business that will be termed a lying in hospital. And this was a business where wealthy white women who got pregnant outside of wedlock could go to spend the nine months or the, late, the, the, the vis visible part of their pregnancy away from prying eyes and have the baby in private to avoid the scandal. And what would happen is if an elite woman from a plantation in Alabama got in trouble, she'd go down to Mobile, and then the sister would bring her to her sister in New Orleans. And the same thing was true for the women of the Garden District in the French Quarter. They could go to Ellen Fallon's house and she would bring them over to Mobile. And the reason why uh, the Fallon sisters are able to carve out this economic niche is that their houses are extraordinarily tasteful, full of fine rosewood furniture and paintings and chandeliers. And uh, the press just goes on and on about how tasteful these women are and how it's the height of fashion. But yet they're mixed race, so they're not in polite society. So what they've done is use their culture and taste to create a place where women raised in those environments but who are in trouble could go have their child surrounded by the trappings that they were accustomed to but hidden from true elite white society. And it's a very clever economic operation that depends on secrecy. So when these women get accused and the whole thing busts loose, that's going to be the, the end of that uh, profession. But they'll be put on trial, uh, the Fallen Sisters, in uh, the summer of 1870 into the fall in, against the backdrop of a yellow fever epidemic. And in many ways, it seems like uh, it's, it could be a trial like the ones that uh, are in your mind's eye when you think about a Southern race trial before the Civil Rights Movement. What, I mean, what trials do you think of? Big, big trials involving race. What's that? Yeah, no, trial, trials were Ray, where the defendants are, are African American. Scottsboro, or the fictional trial in To Kill a Mockingbird, where you just know that, you know, that what's going to happen here is not going to be a, a due process. But this case, while it has some of that feel, it's a, a packed courtroom in a hot summer, and everyone's got fans is thrown so topsy-turvy by Reconstruction because the prosecution is, is a Republican government that is concerned with protecting African-American civil rights but also wanting to show that they can run a, a, a police force and a justice system. When these women are put on trial, the defense uh, by the state, the defense then gains the best uh, representation that they can get, and they get an ex-Confederate general, Theodore Gallier Hunt, is defending the women. The jury is integrated. It's eight whites and four Afro-Creoles. And as far as I can tell, it is a trial that is a trial where due process is actually, the women have a jury of their peers, and there's no women, but it's at least a mixed-race jury, and all the procedures are followed. And it's so uh, thorough that it, you don't know what the verdict is going to be, even as the jury, for I was as, as stunned as anybody else as to what the jury verdict was going to be as the jury foreman is standing to announce it. And this is all playing out in newspapers across the country. Uh, an interesting uh, sidebar here. And uh, New Orleans is kind of a, a spooky place. I am not a believer in the supernatural. But I started uh, researching this case. My wife and I, I was teaching at Loyola in New Orleans at the time. 
And we were living on the northwest corner of Bell Castle and Camp Street in uptown New Orleans. And I started researching the case not knowing where it was going to go. It was just too good a story without even knowing who was going to be accused yet. And when I got to the women who were accused uh, and started doing the research on who they were and reading the court documents, it turned out that these women, or Ellen Fallon, operated her Lion Inn Hospital on the northwest corner of Bell Castle and Camp Street. And uh, that although her house had been torn down, we were living on the exact spot where the woman who's put on trial for the defense was living. And it was a little uh, uncanny, and I started drinking heavily. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, 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 purely a coincidence, but an odd one, that I would be the one who found the story, and you get the idea. Yeah. That's the courtroom, the court building, where the good portion of the trial takes place. Here's a typical headline, the kidnapping case, new revelations, and they're using the classic kind of 19th century Dickens, the mystery of Edwin Drew, the plot thickens, the excitement occasioned by the abduction of the child of Mr. and Mrs. Digby. Now, again, I'm a historian, so I wanted this case in some ways to be a whodunit, a detective story, a classic kind of southern trial story, but I also, you know, need to get promoted to full professor and need uh, this to be a serious historical work. And for those of you, some of you are, are, have been nodding along with everything I'm saying about Reconstruction, so are obviously uh, readers of history of the period. But for most Americans, there is a national amnesia about Reconstruction, despite the efforts, starting with John Hope Franklin, but Kenneth Stamp, all the way through Eric Foner and so on. Most Americans uh, know something about the Civil War and then it just drops. I, have, I teach a Civil War class, and, and this uh, past time I, I taught it, uh, I had two guys who were Civil War reenactors who came to class dressed in their Civil War uniforms, uh, which was a little intimidating because I'd be doing the Battle of Chancellorsville, and I'd be like, you know, Jackson went over here, and you'd get like, that's not the way it happened, Dr. Ross. I was there, you know, and they, they, knew, they knew all the details, and I, I, you know, I like, I like people that want all the details, but when it got to Reconstruction, they knew nothing. Like, it's the moment Lee surrenders, or maybe uh, when Johnston surrenders, that's it. That's all they want to know, and that's it. And if uh, you speak to people of um, a certain age, um, who were raised reading the textbooks or that, uh, as Reconstruction was taught throughout the country, uh, where it was carpet by tragic era of carpetbaggers and scalawags and uh, ignorant former slaves, uh, that view uh, continues to hang on. You folks know the scenes from Gone with the Wind. Home from their lost adventure came the tattered Cavaliers. Grimly, they came hobbling back to the desolation that had once been a land of grace and plenty and slavery and so on. Uh, and with them came another invader, more cruel and vicious than any they had fought, the carpetbagger. And of course, the carpetbaggers in, uh, uh, in the movie are the former Yankee overseer of Terra. Uh, and then a, a, a true carpetbagger from the north, and they cut to a scene of him holding a carpetbagger. And that image of Reconstruction is very difficult to dislodge. Read, go to the Amazon.com reviews of my book, uh, and lots of them uh, are, are uh, uh, very good, but there's a couple of cranks who are just like, this is not what, I'm sorry if you hold this view, I'm not calling you a crank, I'm just, uh, you know, this isn't what Reconstruction uh, uh, was about. And I'm hoping that I build into this book a lot of context in a, in a, a very, pal hopefully a palatable way where you're getting the history of Reconstruction, uh, but not in an academic way. Uh, all of the scholarship of the past 40 years that have been trying to tell a much more complex story of Reconstruction. And for those of you uh, for whom carpetbag is still a dirty word, I'm not saying that all of the so-called carpetbaggers were, uh, you know, were um, flawless. You can find some that you can point out, and the press, of course, seizes on them and say, yeah, they, they, they weren't, but there's tons of them. You read the diaries, these people are not down to exploit. They are here because they believe 
that they are going to uh, really uh, bring a new order in the South, that they, they're the kind of a Teach for America crowd. There, yes, I said that. Okay. And again, I'm not the first person to say this. It's a long, you know, even Du Bois, but onward. And there's been, you know, American experience documentaries that tell the story this way, but somehow it is impossible to dislodge the birth of a nation, gone with the wind uh, version of Reconstruction. And I hope this book is one more step in that effort. Um, when I finished the book, or even as I was writing it, I thought I was the only person alive who knew the story, because none of my history colleagues knew it. I, had I couldn't find anything on the internet that, that anyone had ever written about it before. But as I started writing about it, I started to get interesting emails. And again, one was from a woman named Isabel Baquet in Atlanta who was researching her family's history. And this is the golden age of genealogical history, thanks to Ancestry.com and all of these documented records. It's still a lot of hard work, but tons of fun. Uh, but they had, she had, in trying to untangle the, these, these Afro-Creole families are incredibly tangled. For example, my detective, uh, Jordan, is the son of a wealthy white French planter, John Baptiste Victor Jordan, and then he has relationships with two different uh, mixed race women and four children with each. And even though uh, it was illegal for uh, for there to be interracial marriage in the French portion of town, some of the you know you, you always often hear it's a story of a planter and then he has a mistress in town, but often it's the case like this where he's living openly with these women as his partners and he's going to their baptisms and standing up for them and gives them money but figuring out who's who over these long complex stories is very difficult but so I that's how I got in touch the Baquets got in touch with me and now uh, last week we had uh, uh, you know 70 Baquets and Jordans at this restaurant along with other people which was cool uh, but I also got uh, contacted by a woman named uh, Susan Golden Perkins, she's on the right, who lived in Cary, North Carolina. And she was a descendant of the Digbys. And there's a lot of Digbys around in, in New Orleans, and a lot of Digbys, have, they had a lot of kids scattered around the country. And uh, she said uh, that they had some family records and, and there's the stories of the family. So I went to, I went to Cary to meet with them and another man named Patrick Golden, who was also claimed to be a uh, descendant of the Digbys. Uh, and they actually lived two, two miles away from each other in Cary. I don't know if you folks know Cary. It's a city where all the Yankees have moved to North Carolina. They call it the City Attracting Relocated Yankees. That's the acronym for Cary, but also Relocating New, or New Orleanians. Uh, okay, I got the Saints jacket. Some, yeah, fair. Who that? A fair number of the... Uh, 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 of them uh, live there and they didn't know each other but they both show up and they both had documents that they, they pulled out these files that their family had collected about the Digby case and as these documents came out I was just like no way no way no way and you'll read in the book what emerged uh, it's cool stuff you have to read the book that's Wayne Baquet one of the patriarchs of the uh, Backay family, uh, a little dizzy, his brothers at the New York Times. And then I also was contacted uh, by a woman uh, named uh, Sandra Gunther, who was working on Wall Street at the time. And she said, you know, we've got relatives who are involved in this case as well. So I went up to Union Square in, in her uh, fancy uh, apartment, and the Gunthers turned out to be descendants of the children of the women who were accused, the fallen, of, El, uh, of Ellen Fallen, the accused women. But the Gunthers, her dad was from Wisconsin, he was there, are um, a family that had thought of themselves as white. And as they did their family research, they figured out what had happened is that the children of Ellen Fallen, to get out from the stigma of this case, leave New Orleans, move to Detroit and New York and other cities, and there pass as white, deny their uh, Afro-Creole heritage, and pass as white. 
And this is a, what a choice a lot of Americans made at the turn of the 19th century as Jim Crow settles in in the South and de facto segregation takes over in the North, that your economic opportunities in life were much greater if you could pass as white. And if the, they call, the historians call it the great age of passing. And we got out the family photos, and you could see it in the photos. And they were a family that discovered they had these African-American relatives in New Orleans through this genealogical research and had never known it before. And as they went to one grandmother to say this is what they found, it was clear that one grandmother knew the story and was very angry that this might be uh, told. Uh, sadly, she has passed on. And the rest of the family is, totally thinks it's fascinating that they you know, have a tie to this complex case and to the complex history of race in New Orleans. Uh, tomorrow night I'll be in uh, Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, and the Digby uh, descendants, some who were in the New Orleans, and the uh, Gunther Clarks will be there, uh, which will be fun. This is, uh, this is one of the things that Oxford is doing. So you get the idea. Okay, so that's the kind of, that, that's, and I, I'd, I'd love to answer your questions now. If you have any. Thank you so much for that. And we do have time for some questions. We'll get a microphone to you. Yes, sir. You said you would tell us about what happened to the two accused women. So was there an, did they get justice or not? They, I, I will argue, I will, cannot give you the verdict. But I can tell you this, I absolutely believe they received justice. When, you, when I read the accounts of this trial, this was not some kangaroo trial that you might see at a different point in Southern history. It is a full and fair trial with the best legal defense the system can offer, a uh, you know, fair-minded prosecutor, an integrated jury, and it is, a, it is due process, absolutely. But the verdict, uh, I cannot tell you. Although, if you read the New York Times review, they gave it all away, and I'm still unhappy about it. It's a devil's bargain. But, and, and where are you from, New Orleans? So you lived in New Orleans for how long? Twenty. Oh, where'd you live? Oh, yeah, home of the Strawberry Festival. It's a cool place. Yes. Kevin, come to you. The press played such a huge role in um, the Lindbergh kidnapping, for instance. Um, and it's said that, that it probably extended um, the discovery, finally, of the body and so on. What role did the local press and then the wider press play in this particular? Uh, was it helpful? Was it um, oppressive? Or what was the role, if you would give us an idea? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, New Orleans at the time, and when I say this to a New Orleans audience, they chuckle because it's sort of New Orleans today, was a crime-filled city. There uh, it was a, a murder every day. There was, uh, you know, and normally a story involving a working-class family whose child is missing would make perhaps the page three city intelligence columns where they just listed all the crimes and then would disappear into the mists. And it is purely the anti-reconstruction press sensationalizing this case that turns it into what it becomes. Had they not done that, I, I doubt it even would have been investigated thoroughly. And it's the fact that they see a chance to make political hay out of a crime committed by black women against a white family uh, that turns this case into something much larger. And throughout the investigation, the opponents of Reconstruction are lambasting Warmoth's police force for their, you know, they, for their slow footedness and what they are saying is buffoonery. And even though they, people had been urging them to consult a psychic, the moment they do, they say, see, this is how ridiculous these people are. And uh, it's the press that creates this case. It's the press that the, the great New Orleans kidnapping case is a sensationalistic press. And, and the press does it today, too. They pick certain terrible crimes to highlight 
because for some one reason or another, it reflects what we fear or in current society. And uh, it's absolute, they're absolutely essential to the story. And then when it gets picked up nationally uh, in the North, a lot of the Republican press, their spin on it, uh, you know, they're getting the story off the AP wire, but they're saying this is the chance to show that the Northerners who are down South trying to create a better society are doing a good job. The, the North, there were the, the New Orleans papers and the Mobile papers send lots of reporters. And in fact, it's the best transcripts of the trial because the, 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 the actual transcripts are somewhat rudimentary on some of the testimony. The North does not send reporters. That's an excellent question. Anybody else? Oh, right here. Oh, oh. Uh, this isn't uh, directly related to most of your, your book, but you mentioned the lying in uh, women. Uh, what happened to the children uh, after birth, and how many of those children were mixed race? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I don't uh, know the answer. My, I, 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 based on what the press says at the time, but I can't tell if it's true or not, my guess is that the children then are you know, sent off to an orphanage or adopted by some family that these women somehow know. Uh, but the women that, that are born in these line are not mixed race. The, the women that are in the Lion Inn hospitals are wealthy white women who are hiding from prying eyes during their pregnancy. Uh, of course, the children that are living in the house are, are the mixed race children of these Afro-Creole women. But the children that are born are, I, I mean, you know, are not. Does that make sense? But I don't know. It, it was a secretive operation, and just because they were put on trial doesn't mean they coughed up all those secrets. Uh, it's an uh, uh, interesting uh, conundrum. I'll, I'll give away one more piece of the trial, and that, and, and, and that is that the women's uh, defense will be, no, I can't do that. You're going to have to. Yeah. Right. right over here. I appreciate the, uh, the previous gentleman's question because I wanted to pursue that same uh, line just a little bit. In your research, did you, were you able to, uh, was there any evidence that the house that the sisters uh, maintained was uh, demolished because of what they did or who they were? And how prominent was that kind of activity where the house was located? Uh, two good questions. I'll start with the second one. Not prominent at all where the house was located. Every, when, the, when suspicion leads that way, uh, they're amazed to find uh, that that's going on. They're amazed to find that afro queel women are there. Uh, it is a neighborhood that was, would not have been known for that. I don't have any evidence. The house is demolished in the 20s. By then, the case is forgotten. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, oh, you go to New Orleans and the housing stock is tremendous. You're just the, all these old houses, you can feel the past breathing. But then when you start doing the research, you realize how much has been destroyed by hurricanes, by time, by neglect. And uh, if New Orleans looks cool today, I can only imagine what it looked like when all these houses were standing. And uh, sadly, every person in the book I went to find, there's a, a steamboat captain, the captain of the Eclipse, James Madison Broadwell, who also some people will claim was the mastermind of the whole kidnapping, uh, captain of the fastest steamboat ever from New Orleans to Louisville, uh, had a beautiful house in the Garden District. It's not there. The Digby's house is where the Superdome is. The Fallon's house is gone. Uh, and you don't realize until you start trying to track houses just how much has disappeared. And of course, most of New Orleans is built in, uh, 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 built of wood in a swamp, uh, which is not, uh, it's amazing so much is still there. One more. Yep. Gov Governor Ross, I do have one other question. Help, help me, help me understand the proposed uh, motivation uh, of these women kidnapping the child. What, what was the proposed motivation? Ah, that's the, one of the key questions of the book. What's the motive? And there's all kinds of theories that 
Captain Broadwell uh, needed a baby to replace a lost child that was needed for an inheritance from in-laws that didn't like him. Uh, and there's all, a number of other theories that are raised in the book as to why someone would do this.